Today, we're talking with author and game designer James L. Cambius. We're going to be exploring some exciting concepts like space piracy, strange uses of emerging tech, first contact with aliens, questions like, is the first, or is, I'm sorry, is the prime directive whack? Is that a stupid question? All in all, we're going to be exploring all sorts of top-notch sci-fi books today. So Jim, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Glad to be here. So about a year ago, I started a science fiction themed bookstore. So I've been hawking used sci-fi books with the goal of one day opening a brick and mortar uh, in Southwest Ohio. So you're my second author in my author interview series, and I'm really excited to have you join me today. Well, good luck with the store. Thank you. Thank we, you. We need more bookstores. Right, right. So I got to tell you, our first author to join us uh, was Peter Caudron, and he joined us from Australia. So that's kind of a tough one to uh, beat. Uh, where are you joining us from? Uh, what corner of the, the world today? Not nearly as far away. I'm in New England in Western Massachusetts, which is currently sheathed in ice. Very nice, very nice. Well, I'm really excited to talk about your books today. Um, it's very rare that I like burn through to by the same author in a week. So I'm really excited uh, to kind of talk about some of those works and more that I haven't even explored yet. But uh, yeah, I guess my first kind of thing to talk about is your bio. I know that you're a, a writer. I know that you're a game designer. Um, tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, I grew up in New Orleans. And when people ask me where I'm from, they I tell them I'm from New Orleans, even though I haven't lived there in, gosh, 30 years now. Um, I, um, I, I went to the University of Chicago and, uh, um, that was where I met my wife. And from there we moved to, uh, we spent time in North Carolina while she was in graduate school and then up to New England. Um, and I started freelance writing as a result of those, all that moving around because it, I had been working for a publisher in Chicago for a while, but, um, when we moved to North Carolina, there weren't any jobs immediately available. So I started writing short um, uh, role-playing game articles. But this was back when role-playing game publishers had house magazines. The only one that's still in existence is Dragon, sadly. And, um, but you know, Game Designers Workshop had Challenge Magazine and Steve Jackson had The Space Gamer. And uh, you know, so I could crank out a 3000 word role-playing article every week. Very cool. Very, very cool. Well, uh, the first book of yours that I read, I think was your first uh, book, the Darkling Sea, and that just blew me away. I'm a sucker for first contact novels. So this idea of playing with the prime directive like immediately caught my attention. Uh, I, I love doing interviews where we kind of like try to hook someone on checking out a book. So what's your like hook for a Darkling Sea? Well, the hook was the prime directive um, in, the, in the late 1990s when uh, my wife and I were living in Ithaca, New York, I was working, I was part of the team for Last Unicorn Games, producing a Star Trek role-playing game, one of the best of the many Star Trek role-playing games that have been published over the years. And um, they were distributed by Simon & Schuster, which published Pocket Books, the Star Trek novels. And so I figured, oh, well, I'm practically writing for Pocket Books already, so I, decided, okay, I'll, I'll pitch John Order, Ordover, the editor at, at Pocket, a Star Trek novel, and maybe I can get my foot into the science fiction writing door that way. Um, uh, about three things happened before I could get to any of that. Uh, the first was that um, uh, Pocket Books quit publishing Star Trek novels, or at least <laughs> dramatically scaled back. Uh, the second was that um, through some Weirdness with the uh, licensing arrangement, which I never quite understood. Uh, Last Unicorn lost the Star Trek license. Um, and uh, uh, so I decided, well, the heck with it. I'll just write this as a novel, as a non-Star Trek novel. Is it weird that I feel like saying I'm kind of happy those things happened? So we got this book because it is uh, kind of critical of a Star Trek concept. So well, that was that was. It. That was going to be the fundamental conflict anyway, is, you know, how do you apply the prime directive to a species which can literally never know about the universe unless somebody breaks it? And that was going to be the, the primary ethical dilemma. Um, 
Uh, but yes, once I no longer was trying to work within the constraints of the Trekiverse, then I could actually, you know, do it in a bit more, customize it a bit more. Um, yeah, like a super original wild way where you've got multiple alien species and, you know, you've got the Sholin saying, humans, you're not allowed to talk to these right. Omicarans. You're not allowed to let them know that they're, you're actually not alone on this uh, water world, if you will. And uh, I just loved how there's two alien species, humans and the Sholin, and then, you know, they know about, you know, other life yeah. and they're observing and just like right on the edge of this society. And I just love the tension and the thriller components. It's, it's, it's action filled. Oftentimes I'll read like an action book. I think I've got like someone that comes to mind is like Richard Morgan and Altered Carbon. Like that's really good action. And it's like juicy action, but I feel like what you've accomplished, and at least the two books that I've read so far, is it's like a nice balance of ideas, character development, action, and like the thing that I will pitch people on when I talk about your books is pacing. I feel like your books, they grab you and they just rock and roll till the end. So next book, Corsair, I just finished that today. Uh, I ate that up like candy. Give us the pitch on Corsair. Well, Corsair was, it was my second novel, and um, it's based on a short story that I wrote for a, uh, uh, there's a small press zine called Shimmer, and back in uh, something like 2014, they did a special pirate-themed issue, and this was right around the time, this was right around the time that, you know, the Pirates of the Caribbean movie was, you know, uh, looting the box office and so I figured okay everybody's going to be doing fantasy pirates and horror pirates so I'm going to do some science fiction pirates so I wrote a story about a science fiction pirate and I'm enough of a hard science fiction nerd that I figured okay how are you going to make piracy work well the answer is you leave the pirates on the ground the space pirate ship is up in space and it's doing pirate stuff and it's being controlled from a luxury hotel room by Captain Black the space pirate AKA David Schwartz and um, uh, my agent, when we were casting around for what to do after Darkling Sea, my agent said, well, this short story, you know, this looks like it could, it could grow into a novel quite easily. And I said, yeah, you're right, it could. And the, the, I even remember the specific moment where I figured out how to make it into a novel was, and this is total nerdery, um, as long as it's not a spoiler, let's hear it. Let's hear it. No, but there's there's a moment later in the novel when the when the bad guy's plot is revealed about why they really want David to hijack a a space uh, payload, and uh, the, it hinges on a little bit of physics where uh, uh, you know you you get your best energy efficiency when you're doing maneuvers deep in a gravity well rather than uh, out in space. It has to do with conservation of energy. And so once I realized that, it's like, oh, so that means that this discovery can happen when the payload is, you know, orbiting close to Earth and then swings out again on its deadly mission. And I'm trying to avoid spoilers here. Yeah. No, well, what's so funny to me is that, like, I don't know how close you follow sports, but J.R. Smith had this amazing tweet. He, he, he finished his MBA career and now he's back in college and he's like a successful NBA champion who's in college. And he did this tweet this week that was like, who introduced letters to math? I hate this. And I kind of put myself on that level of math and comprehension. But uh, I've got, I don't know, a couple thousand sci-fi books behind me and I've read hundreds of sci-fi books and I love hard sci-fi, but like gun to my head, I'm just worthless at it. So I really like how you, you use hard sci-fi elements, but the story is not bogged down and just like endless info dumps and like as much as I love Neil Stevenson and Termination Shock and all Snow Crash and you know Fall or Dodge and all these books of his that have just these dense uh kind of like Kim Stanley Robinson you got these dense info dumps you kind of avoid that you build the world you develop the character and you advance the plot in an actionable way so kudos to you for that because that's tough well thank you uh <laughs> what was interesting though is the the, the science also gave me this the plot structure because the whole action of that novel had to fit within the time frame of basically something leaving the moon circling around the earth and going back to the moon and that you know there's a that's going to take six days and so that's how long the novel had to take 
So I, I have a, a little bit of a question for you and we can, we can do like Corsair questions first, or we can do a darkly see it's really whatever you want, which way you want to go. Whichever. All right. Well, let's, let's go Corsair because space piracy, I was trying to do a little bit of research and I saw somebody's hot take and I was like, this is the internet that could be a spicy hot take that has no merit, or that could be like an interesting challenge. So I've heard things about, uh, what is the value proposition? Like, why does someone like Musk or Bezos or Branson or some, one of these, you know, people that see value maybe outside of their name on us on a rock to go and develop and profit off of, I don't know, asteroid mining or um, putting things on the moon. Helium-3, can you explain like this concept? Is it viable? Uh, when we ever get fusion, is this a dance that we can actually do? Will there be space pirates? I'm leaving the floor open to you. Okay, well, right now, the most valuable resources in outer space are services like communication satellites and providing fuel to communication satellites. Starlink and things like that. Right. And there actually are some opportunities for piracy there, because if you can essentially hijack a communication satellite, hold it for ransom, you know, that's a valuable object and just denying service its services to its owners means, you know, that's worth a lot of money. Um, but that's not very exciting for a story. Um, so I wanted to have pirates, a short story. <laughs> right, but I wanted to have pirates stealing stuff. And my two options were basically, okay, they can either be stealing platinum because there's this company called space resources, um, which was, uh, doing research on mining platinum from asteroids because most of Earth's platinum comes from space. It's called a siderophile metal. In fact, because it's basically associated with impact craters, um, Earth's primordial platinum is all 4,000 miles under your feet in the core of the planet. Um, yeah, because it's dense. Um, so, you know, when Earth was still molten, it all kind of settled to the bottom. Um, but so most of the platinum that we have comes from space. And it's not, it's a, lit, it's a lot more common proportionately in space than it is on Earth. So they were talking about, yeah, we'll send robots out to mine asteroids and just drop giant balls of platinum into the desert to recover, which is, you know, not good if you're underneath it, but, uh, you know, it's potentially quite valuable. But that would require, like, to my mind, that would that was like a level more space infrastructure than I wanted. I wanted to sure. a nearer future. Um, so I came up with, so helium-3 is is definitely, it is a fusion fuel. It's, it's an isotope of helium that's, that's um, more massive. It's got three neutrons instead of two. Um, and, you know, there's whoa, whoa, a fusion. Whoa, is that the helium three? Boom. No. <laughs> yeah. I, lo um, I love when and, things are as simple as it, it sounds, right? Yeah. And so, you know, you can, you can fuse helium three. I forget what their specific reaction is, but anyway, it is a relatively feasible fusion reaction because there's lots of different fusion reactions. Um, um, and, you know, so it's potentially quite valuable. And, you know, there has been serious discussion of, of mining it from the moon. From what I understand, it would probably be a lot easier to make it on Earth because mm -hmm. we have, you know, nuclear reactors and, you know, you just, you know, essentially fill the void inside a nuclear reactor with helium and let it absorb neutrons. And, you know, it's probably cheaper to do that than it is to send a uh, you know, build a manufacturing base on the moon. Um, but I wanted something that was very valuable. And, you know, at current energy prices, a ton of liquid helium three would be worth something like a billion dollars. Mm. So, you know, okay, what do you do for a billion dollars? Right, yeah. right. And, and, Don't and at that, that volume that, that I could see how it, would, it makes sense in the long term, especially if, you know, it might be here on earth, but what if you need it for future space? development and colonization. Right, right. Yes. And, you know, that's a big part of space industrialization is just that stuff in space is already in space. And that, like, you know, accounts for a lot of the value of it. Um, uh, I also, though, threw in a whole sort of geopolitical terrorism aspect to it, where, you know, there's a lot of people on Earth who might not be so happy if cheap fusion was cutting into their, their profits. And so they might Great be bankrolling point. it. That's a great point. All right. So uh, fun fact about me, 
uh, my family, I don't know if you can see the book here, but it's Admiral Benbow. You know, uh, he was an English officer for those watching that might not be familiar with historical members of the Royal Navy. But my family swears, like newspaper clippings, like showing lineage, that I am related to a serious pirate hunter, Admiral John Benbow. And he was famed for fighting Algerian pirates. So I have a question about prep work for Corsair because um, there's a lot, like you said, you already kind of talked about Pirates of the Caribbean and how you were talking with, um, you know, your agent and, and the development process of coming up with Corsair. But I guess my question to you is, without giving anything away, obviously a book about space pirates is going to have elements of the CIA and the FBI and the intelligence agencies and, and space agencies. And, you know, I'm in Southwest Ohio, so we've got, you know, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base here and all sorts of Air Force Research Lab projects and things like that. So how closely did you follow that? And do you continue to follow that as you come up with books like Corsair? I've always been interested in it. And yes, I did a lot of research, although, of course, you know, subsequent history, you know, kind of sandbagged me. I never expected that we would actually have an independent space force by 2022. So, you know, air, uh, uh, my, my pirate hunter character is Air Force Space Command, which is now the Space Force, you know, so she, you know, it's already a little obsolete. Um, but, I, um, I, you know, I gotta say this, I think it's still so new to the public that reading it this week, it never once, it wasn't like reading a Larry Niven novel where you're like, that didn't age well. That doesn't fit. Into there, aren't, the there, there aren't any not Martians. To, <laughs> not, not, to, not to, you know, diss Larry Niven. I like some of his books. Um, okay, so here's my other question for you. You know, I've read plenty of Wired articles that key in on a famous, you know, hacker that did X, Y, or Z. Did you have any inspiration for David Schwartz? He's like your big hotshot hacker, the space pirate who's kind of playing in like a metaverse vr kind of rig i'd love for you to kind of touch on that and was there any uh, inspiration when you kind of designed that character he, he's not based on any specific person um basically i i very seldom actually create characters based on people i know or people i've met it's more who would be like this who would do this right and so i wanted him to be kind of an egotistical you know he's the he's the smartest guy in the room and he wants to prove it and uh you know so he essentially you know i had to create him to fit his role sure. um um yeah none of the characters in the book are based on real people <laughs> Well, I, I will say this, a lot of the um, action and plot elements and just like the advancement of the story involves things that, you know, are becoming more and more commonplace. I feel like more and more people are learning about what ghost guns are and, you know, more and more students are being exposed to things like 3D printers. I'm curious, uh, you know, what it was like kind of how how do you process like emerging tech and like measuring how much uh because it's like a near future novel. So I'm curious, like, how do you incorporate this stuff? How do you think about it? Is there anything like drone warfare where you've been noticing like that's going to be something I put in a new novel? Yes, right. Uh, so drones were obviously going to be important. And I read up just, <laughs> okay. For that novel, I actually did make an effort to read Wired magazine a lot because <laughs> it's, it's a good thing. Like, it's yes, a good, and it's, it's a it's, cheat sheet. Plus, that's sort of the market for the book, right? Is wired readers. So, that's you know, very true. I, I basically immersed myself in that kind of, you know, the, the cool next generation tech uh, hoopla. Um, there's also, uh, I found a very good listing of emerging technologies for military with military applications. Um, uh, was it US Army Training and Doctrine Command or something like that? And it's this, uh, it was this wonderful, you know, um, essentially a, a slide from some talk, no doubt about, and it was a whole matrix of new technologies ranging from like very near future to, you know, very far out and also ranging from, you know, very plausible to very implausible. And, you know, so I could sort of look on that matrix and try to figure, I tried to stick to the plausible side of it, although it, it, what was interesting is it was all footnoted, right? So it wasn't just like we could do this. It was, yeah. it was, you know, yeah, 3D printing, you know, this company is working on it or whatever. And, um, you know, they even had like time travel on it. I don't know who's working on that, but 
the time dilation. We're just going to send some folks way far out in space, bring them back. Uh, I do have to say, if I'm any good at my Google Foo, hopefully this is the part of the video where I'm like throwing that graphic up and you can see. Some I will see if I can there. find that link again. Yes. Very cool. Well, so uh, I want to kind of quick pivot because I'm, we got so much to cover, but one of the things about a Darkling C that I really enjoyed is the setting. Um, it made me think of Sphere. It made me think of a couple different, I don't know if you saw the movie that came out a couple years ago with, I think it was Kristen Stewart. It was called Underwater. I got serious underwater vibes, which that, by the way, if you've not seen that, check that flick out. If you're watching this interview, that movie is very fun. It's kind of quirky at the end, but it's very fun. But I got to ask you, inspiration wise, um, what was kind of your thought? Like, how did you come up with the setting for where the Elmatarns lived? Right. Well, flipping back to that idea of a Star Trek novel, it had to be an environment where they would not be able to perceive the universe. So that the ice covered world rapidly was like a, an obvious setting. After that, um, I've done some recreational diving, uh, scuba, you know, uh, more back then than I have recently. Um, and so, you know, I had some sort of I could describe what it's like to be underwater. I think that you have accomplished um, that really well because I've never gone diving, but it, it, now that you say that, it does feel like you're pretty, like the author and the point of perspective, it just feels very, I don't know if the word's valid, it's just accurate, I guess. And then I had to make up the Ilmatarans and I tried to make it like an Ilmataran, uh, you know, I wanted to, to almost do it like, like a big, like realist novel about El Mataran. So I like wanted to develop as much of their society as possible. So, and, and you know, put as much of it in. So, you know, I, I spent quite a while coming up with what would their technology be? What, would, what can't they do? What can they do? Um, and so, you know, I, I, there's a lot of scenes which you know, potentially aren't actually advancing the plot but are to just show you what World the building. lives of yeah. the Ilmatarans are like because I thought that was interesting and apparently you do too. <laughs> I, I, I gotta tell you I, I'm, I have, I'm so curious I don't think this is a spoiler so minor minor like itty bitty not a spoiler at all in my opinion but the Ilmatarans the way that they record things I thought was so interesting. And is so that's that real. Okay, you have to. Okay, so I, pl folks, I plagiarized that from the Incas. <laughs> good. I I now know that, and I'm better for it. So uh, I, I was back around watching, the. I'm just gonna say this. Cause I want to set the stage for folks watching. A darkling sea has aliens underwater, and I don't want to give a spoiler away, but they record things by writing on ropes. By go ahead. <laughs> well, they tie knots in the ropes. Yes, and the, and the spacing and of the knots then sort of gives them the, the, and that is based on an actual record keeping method used by the ancient Inca empire. They were called quipus or quipu. I don't know quite how to pronounce it. I learned about this as a result of role-playing game writing because I worked on, uh, back in the 90s, our Talsorian games, Mike Pondsmith's outfit, had a uh, uh, very well-regarded, but unfortunately not very commercially successful game called Castle Falkenstein, which was fantasy steampunk uh, role-playing. And I wrote a South America source book for them. So it's South America in the imaginary 1870s with magic and cool. steampunk technology. And unfortunately they shut down the game line before it was published. No. A lot of that material wound up in GURPS Castle Falkenstein, which I wrote, co-wrote with Phil Masters, who also had an unpublished <laughs> Falkenstein source book that he had written for Talsorian. So there's an awful lot of stuff about South America and the Middle East in GURPS Castle Falkenstein, because those were the books that he and I had basically ready to go. So this is the part of the interview where I say, uh, you're a game designer, and you've got a laundry list of successful games that you've designed. Uh, I play Euchre. I've done Settlers before. Uh, I did Risk a little bit with friends in high school that, you know, those games will last like 600 years, uh, literally. Um, what are your recommendations for someone who devours science fiction but is not really uh, that hip to what you, what you kind of design? Well, uh, if you like uh, tabletop role-playing games, um, you know, do it by the genre you like. Uh, I wrote stuff for, as I said, Castle Falkenstein and 
uh, game designers workshops steampunk game uh, space 1889 so if you like steampunk adventures or the the ur texts that they're based on you know Jules Verne and H.G. Wells those would be the ones to, to try out if you like space opera I've written some stuff for um, uh, star hero uh, from uh, hero games um, that's a bit more meta that's uh, you know that there is a campaign setting the the uh, empire in that one but i actually you know wrote the wrote the book as here's how you create a science fiction campaign okay, okay. Um, cool. Cool. um so uh that that one's good um if you like hard sf stuff uh you can check out gurps mars which is for steve jackson games is gurps uh system and it's uh three or four different versions of mars so there's Near future Mars, terraformed Mars, um, um, pulp Mars. Kim Stanley Robinson read Mars series right behind me. It's kind of making yeah. me think of that. Well, there's a whole chapter which is basically Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars. <laughs> Very cool. Um, so I, it's it's a space that I know that I would just love. <laughs> I just haven't kind of dove down that rabbit hole yet. Um, pivoting back real quick to a darkling sea, though, Europa. If, 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 you know, for some reason, everybody gave me all their money and you get one mission to go check out, is there other life? I know we should continue looking at Mars and, and James Webb's supposed to be giving us all this insightful information, but I want to go and see what's in Europa. Thoughts on Europa? Yeah, I mean, yes, the, the planet Ilmatar or the moon Ilmatar is basically a slightly different version of Europa in a different star system. And the only reason I did that was that I didn't want some joker to make some discovery which would make my book obsolete too fast. <laughs> so I stuck him in another star system. You've got to um, ensure this, this, this has got to be, this has got to be protected. Right. <laughs> I um, love it. But otherwise, you know, yes, it's basically Europa. It's uh, tidal heating from a nearby gas from the, the gas giant that it orbits means that there's a liquid water ocean under an icy crust. Um, and so there's lots of volcanic activity at the bottom of the ocean and that provides the chemical basis for uh, life on that world. Um, but it's anaerobic life, which means they, they're they not as energetic as humans. You know, the, the maintaining our pace of activity wears them out. <laughs> I, I No, I love that part of it. it I think you did a really good job uh, with a darkling sea, a darkling sea, of making them feel foreign enough that they're relatable but weird, and in some cases very uncomfortably weird. Not weird. I'm not going to say anything more on that front. But uh, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> yes, yes. So you know, I I, I finished two of your books in a week. Um, really impressed. I love the pacing characters were fun it just they're just fun I think sometimes you can read a, I, there's plenty of sci-fi books I've read where I was like I don't know if I liked it I am impressed by it I don't know if I'd call it fun I'm, I'm better for reading it but it was just weird um there's some books in that realm your books are fun period dot like I I thought they were fun so tell me about a couple of your others I know there's the initiate uh I think it's our kids world Arkad's yeah our kids world and the Godel operation, yeah. So tell me about these books. Well, so Darkling Sea and um, um, Corsair were both published by Tor Books. Okay. Um, and they were both acquired by uh, David Hartwell. Um, uh, but after he died, which was a loss to science fiction and the world in general, because he was a wonderful man, um, uh, my, uh, he died two weeks before I handed in Arcad's World, and I was just I wished he had had the chance to see it because I wanted him to like it. <laughs> but uh, he, he passed away very suddenly and unexpectedly. And so I was two weeks away from finishing the book. Um, and uh, uh, in the reorganization at Tor Books, which was, you know, they weren't expecting it either. So there was a lot of sort of frenzied, you know, what are we going to do? Who's going to take these projects? I kind of fell through the cracks. Um, they did not want Arcad's world. I So my agent shopped it around elsewhere. Uh, we were pitching it as a young adult book, basically. Um, but mm -hmm. he said, that my agent told me that several publishers had told him, well, it doesn't have enough sex in it to be a young adult book. <laughs> I think that's so, a scathing rebuke of everything, but keep going. So we, just, so we just revised the pitch a little. It's like, well, okay, it's just a regular novel. But I only actually got to sell it 
uh, when I went to the Tennessee Valley Interstellar Workshop in 2017, which was a, a meeting at um, in Huntsville, Alabama, which is of course home to the Marshall Space Flight Center. And it was about, uh, mostly about Project Starshot, which is this genuine, real, funded by a Russian billionaire program to use a big ass laser to launch tiny space probes to Proxima Centauri. And I've been following that and everything about it is fantastical and yes. exciting and yes. bizarre. And I just keep having to go, is that happening? Is that still happening? Is what, what's uh, the other they're, they're still, they're still per, per, you know, go, moving forward on it. Uh, what was fun is that at that at that meeting, you know, the amateurs, the 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 you know the the private group, were the sane ones. The crazy howling crazy people were the people from Jet Propulsion Laboratory who wanted to use a I think it was a petawatt laser, which is to say ten to the fifteenth watts, to launch a one ton probe with a lander, you know, just like uh, you know on they do on Mars across interstellar distances at a significant chunk of the speed of light. <laughs> it's like, well, I, go big or go home, I guess. You know, it's funny, <laughs> there's like bumper stickers every once in a while with like a penny for NASA. And it's like, and obviously the US budget, there's such a small fragment of what actually goes towards NASA yeah. stuff. I'm like, give me two dimes for NASA. I want that stuff. I think like some of the world's biggest questions, philosophical and just... I'm not talking about Velcro, but I'm talking about the internet and all these great things that we invent, you know, on the way to these discoveries. So I totally cut you off though. Yeah. So give me- give So me anyway, so pitch. at the Interstellar Workshop, one of the things we did, a bunch of us went on a tour of the Marshall Space Flight Center, because of course you do when you're in Huntsville. And part of the tour involved going up to the old Apollo rocket engine test stand, which is this great big crumbling piece of 1960s steel and concrete uh, engineering. Um, and most of the others went all the way up to the top on the terrifying rickety rusting metal stairway, but I decided to stay down by the elevator and Tony Weisskopf, the publisher at Bain Books, um, also stayed down by the elevator. She was having some knee problems at the time. Plus, she grew up there, so I think she's been to the top already. Yeah. Um, Once you've seen it, you've seen it. <laughs> so while we were killing time, I happened to talk to her about, you know, isn't it a shame that there isn't more, you know, young adult type science fiction suitable for boy readers? And oh, by the way, I have this manuscript. Would you like to see it? And she said, sure, because I think, you know, if somebody pitches a science fiction novel to you on a rocket test stand, you have to say yes. <laughs> so it, she bought it. Comes it comes with the territory. It just right, you know. So she bought it, and that was Arcad's world, um, which is the story of a young man who has grown up uh, basically all as the only human on a world inhabited by um, uh, several intelligent alien species. So there's. There's the um, the Ituti, who are these flying creatures. There's the uh, Vzim, who are these little serpentine creatures who are uh, you know live underground. There's the uh, the Pfifu. There's the the Ah. There's the uh, the, uh, the dreaded <laughs> Stau Stau, uh, and a bunch of others who didn't make it, who I created but didn't make it into the novel. Um, and uh, so. Basically, it's, you know, and then a group of humans arrive and they're looking for something. And so Arcad is helping them find it and, but is also discovering something about his own past. And oh, um, very cool. Yeah. And so it's a, it's heavily informed by Rudyard Kipling's Kim, among others. Okay. And, I, and I've got a copy of that laying around. I know I've got probably a dozen or so copies on the bookstore, but well, uh, uh, it's is, possibly the greatest novel, uh, Kim anyway, is possibly the greatest novel in English language. So I urge you to read it. Um, I, I anyway, add it to my ever extending to be read list. So it's heavily informed by Kim and the Jungle Book, sort of like a cross between the two, I guess. Okay. Uh, very much a, an homage to Kipling there. And, um, you know, I had great fun writing it. Um, uh, and um, yeah, that was one where I, you know, and if you want to talk about, you know, exciting adventures, you know, he spends a lot of the book, like being chased by pirates, being chased by bandits, uh, uh, falling off of things, um, 
So, <laughs> It's, it's, so it's I, I, definitely an adventure story. I send bookmarks and postcards when, when people buy books for me and I make these lists. So like it's the Hugo Award winners, it's the Nebula Award winners, it's the Arthur C. Clarke winners. And you can check them off and use them as a bookmark. And I've been playing with this list that I've been developing of like space pirates as a you know, subgenre, right? And uh, I'm very excited to know I've got a couple from you that I can add to this bookmark. Uh, so people know, like, if this is a vibe that you like, like, there's plenty of good stuff out there. Um, I have to admit, though, this year was supposed to be my deep dive into cyberpunk and kind of getting more uh, deep. Like, I've done a lot of, like, the required reading cyberpunk, like, the the, the, the pillars of cyberpunk. And now I'm kind of getting into the, the, the farther reaches of the subgenre. But uh, I'm so glad that I found Corsair. And now hearing about this, it's got space parts, goes on the bookmark. So yes, it's definitely a it's a planetary romance in the old school, I guess. Um, so tell me about the initiate. So then after that, uh, I decided to completely change gears and write um, a contemporary fantasy, um, partly having to do with my education because I got my degree at Chicago in the history and philosophy of science, particularly focusing on the era of the scientific revolution. Uh, I wrote my bachelor paper about Robert Hooke who was a contemporary and rival of Isaac Newton. And that was an era when, you know, Isaac Newton spent as much of his life doing alchemy as he did doing physics and didn't see any distinction between the two. And so, you know, that was like, so magic, alchemy, pseudoscience and science were all a continuum together, back then. Yeah. So, you know, I wound up learning a lot just along the way about, magic, actual historical magic, not the stuff that modern day posers pretend to be doing. Um, sorry, posers. Um, and, shots uh, fired. Didn't think I'd get shots fired today. No. <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm, I'm terrible that way. Um, no, you're good. Keep going. Um, so um, I, I wanted to do a, I wanted to put some of that to use. So I, I wrote a novel about a man who joins the secret uh, ancient order of mad magicians who secretly rule the world and starts murdering them all. Um, my, my elevator pitch version is what if John Wick was Harry Potter? See that, you know, people have short attention spans. If you're interested in a book where John Wick and Harry Potter, that sounds like, that sounds like a hook, man. Uh, what about the, is it the Goodell operation? Right. And so the initiate came out um, uh, in, uh, in, 2019 and then unfortunately a lot of the promotion for it got sort of stepped on by the uh, emerging virus and then uh, uh, the um, uh, the Godel operation sorry no it came out in early 2020 and got squashed by the virus and then the Godel operation meanwhile was that was a project which I've been working on off and on since something like 2014. Um, I, I started thinking back then about what would it what would it be like to live in a very far future society? A Kardashev II civilization. I don't know if you're familiar with the oh. Kardashev scale. You don't challenge my nerdiness. You know, I, I hope that we can, you know, I want to see dice and spheres. I want to see us okay. moving stars. And yes, don't okay. challenge my nerdiness. No. Okay, so this is literally, you know, dice and sphere future where it's, it's not a single giant ping pong ball around the sun. It's just that there's, a whole lot of objects circling the sun and so all of the sun's output is captured. In I fact, think of like Starlink and all the satellites around telecommunications on right. Earth. In fact, I did the math and figured, you know, okay, if they're about this size, how many would there be? And I came up with the answer of, oh, there would be about a billion. So that's the title of the series or the setting for the Godel operation is The Billion Worlds. And so Very the, cool. the Billion Worlds, uh, uh, in the 10th millennium. And um, uh, so, you know, I, I've been thinking about that for a while and I, um, uh, I realized that you can tell just about any science fiction story in that setting, because by that point, you know, there, will, there are hundreds, if not thousands of genetically engineered species. So we've, we've made our own aliens. There's artificial intelligences ranging from dumber than, you know, from, from sub-intelligent to got literally godlike super intelligences um 
So I could tell basically any story I wanted. Um, and so Which is I, a really convenient and fun space to be. I'm thinking of one of my absolute favorite books by Alistair Reynolds, uh, House of Sons, where kind of a similar thing with Shatterlings, where they've been around for so long. There's so many permutations of them. They look different. And I, I think that the space that you just described is kind of some of the most fun science fiction because it, right. there, it, there's still rules, but there's a lot more opportunity. Oh, I'm absolutely playing with the net up. It's like, I'm not using, there is no magic technology. I mean, there's technology which looks like magic, but it's, you know, I'm not breaking any physical law. Sure. Um, uh, and so um, uh, the Godel operation itself is about uh, uh, a, it's narrated by a, uh, an artificial intelligence, a, a, a mech named Daslak, who's a sp- wearing a, a, a spider body, a spider mech, he calls himself, you know, and his- Because uh, why not? Right. And Daslak's pet human, Z, who's a young man, um, and they, are, they leave home in search of Z's imaginary girlfriend, and it goes on from there. <laughs> Interesting. Very fun. Well, I, I feel like you got hella range, man. When I finished the Darkling Sea, I uh, reached out to you. And then when you said you do the interview, I was like, well, I got to do more than one book. And then I did Corsair and like that. And uh, I think you got a, a lifelong reader. I, re- I did some research before we, we hopped on today. And I think I saw some very positive news about maybe some other books in the worlds that I've already been exposed to so far. Right. There's, there's the Goodreads thing, which I don't know if I should like add a correction to because I would like to write a follow-up to Darkling Sea. And I even discussed it with my publisher. And my publisher said, when the rights to it revert to you from Tor, so that we can publish, so that Bain can publish, reprint Darkling Sea and then publish a sequel, that'll happen. But I don't think that's going to happen for a few more years. So that's just tied up in publishing rules. Well, I could say that I'm uh, very excited to to see future works from you, and I I just was very impressed. Now I got to ask because there are billions of strange people on this planet, and I love talking to people like yourself because I think we're strange in a similar way, and that we're fascinated by science and the philosophical implications of the things that science has put in front of us. And I think you play with great ethical questions, great philosophical questions, and uh, all the action in between. With your perspective, you know, with your life experiences and the books that you've written and the worlds that you've created, how do you feel about the future moving forward? I'm very fatigued. This is like year two, but it feels like year 20 of the pandemic. But I'm yeah. curious, you know, with all your perspectives, what's your, how are you feeling about the future for just humanity, us in general, in this little bubble of time that we are right now? What, how are you feeling? I am actually fairly optimistic about the future. Um, um, you know, there may, there will undoubtedly be setbacks and things that I don't like happening. Some of them might be things I really don't like, but I think I think we're in for the long haul here. You know, um, I, I I have never really believed that. One of the one of the problems I have with a lot of the uh, uh, explanations for the uh, the Fermi paradox about why we don't see evidence of of other civilizations, you know, the, the the casual assumption that oh well they just destroy themselves and it's like it's hard to destroy yourselves. Life finds a way. <laughs> yes, and you know even okay there was a time something like I want to say fifty thousand years ago. Don't quote me on this. Seventy maybe, where it's thought that humanity was down to something like two dozen people. Um, uh, and, you know, there was two dozen humans and, you know, the highest technology we had was the stone axe head, not even on a handle, just a stone axe that you hit things with in your hand. And, you know, we bounced back from that. And if you can bounce back from two dozen people in, an, in the aftermath of a super volcano event with, hand, with stone axes as your highest technology, you know, what can you, you know, how do you get rid of 9 billion people? <laughs> well, you know, as, as controversial as Elon Musk is and his kind of resounding call that we need to be a multi-planetary species and then the reverberation of that, which is 
yo, can we just like get this kind of rock right a little bit? I kind of kind of oscillate in between where I'm like, I want colonies on the moon. I want to be able to visit there before I die. Commercialize this enough where it's affordable for everyday schmoes like me to be able to visit. But I do kind of understand uh, and, and kind of meet that optimism that you have, because I do think that you know we will find a way. But I got to follow up with that question around, you probably, like we kind of talked about earlier, follow some tech. Is there any tech that kind of is blowing you away right now or interesting? I'm thinking about like, I think it was this week or last week that BMW debuted that car that changes colors. It changes and color, I was like, yes. tr- like, explain to me like a five-year-old how this works. And someone was like, you know, the e-readers and the, the ink, like think of that. Any tech right now that's kind of blowing you away? Okay, that one actually though, yeah. I'm old enough to remember mood rings, which was go. a piece of 1970s technology where you had this ring that changed color based on your body. Oh, well, mood rings made their rounds in the 90s. I think they okay. were like in the when you well, go to the I, pizza joint and they've got the little quarter machine that drops the toy down. I think so I got I assume, one of those then. So I, from what I've heard, I think the BMW paint must work on the same principle that it, it's temperature sensitive because people talk about like it it have it it's it doesn't work if the if it gets too cold or whatever there's but, almost anything where i don't work after i get yeah, too that's cold true. that's just the rule of the universe <laughs> but um okay. the the mind-blowing technology right now for me is actually biotechnology um you know google today pig heart and yeah, I was going to say, about, that was big news this week. Uh, you know, transplant of a genetically modified pig's heart into a human. And, you know, that's that's something which w- would have been just magic uh, in 1970. I, that, that's such a good uh, observation. You know, growing up and coming of age in the early 2000s, I remember, and I don't even know, it was, I have to imagine it's not, but there was a federal ban on research around like stem cells and stuff and like you know i have a stepbrother who has diabetes and like growing up we were like legitimately annoyed as a family that like there wasn't more money going into some of these uh, biomedical advancements to to take on challenges that you know so many families know so that's a really uh interesting observation so so we're in the in the goal and okay or a better example and much more time much more like generally applicable the amazing rapidity with which the coronavirus vaccines were developed. Uh, I will will say this till the day comes in. Operation Warp Speed is one of the most amazing things we've done in an incredibly long time. Well, especially since um, I know particularly the Moderna vaccine, I don't know too much about how the Pfizer or Johnson & Johnson vaccines work, but the Moderna vaccine is broadly applicable. It's, you know, that's not just a new vaccine. That's a new way of doing vaccines, mm. which can be applied to every disease that comes along after this. Yeah, that's. So, fa- I mean, the tech, the biotech around it is exciting. Uh, I'm one of those people that says yes. There will always be challenges. Yes, there will always be setbacks. But I gotta, I gotta kind of touch on this though because I kept thinking about it during Corsair. What's your vibe on the metaverse? Because I've been joking with friends uh, on my phone. I've had a folder with all of my social media called metaverse for like five years. Ever since I read Snow Crash, I like made the folder, dropped Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. That was like my metaverse folder. So I I feel like I'm kind of a trailblazer in that respect outside of, I know how to listen to Neil Stevenson, but what's your take on the metaverse? So, I mean, it's pretty obvious just looking around how everyone in the modern world, and it seems to be literally everyone, you know, has, is so connected up now. And, you know, we spend as much time looking at little screens in our hands as we do, uh, you know, doing things in the real world. I'm actually kind of retro in that I just like two months ago got my first smartphone. Before that, I used a little flip phone, which made phone calls and nothing else. Wait a second. You were writing these books where they're like tech brilliant people and you're rocking like a flip phone <laughs> i love that i love that part, so part, partly because that way you know i i i i got books written because i wasn't getting phone calls um yeah it was, it's amazing <laughs> what you can do when you kind of sideline turn, uh, turn the thing off and stick it in your pocket um but now i i have a big old smartphone and so probably my productivity will go through the floor um <laughs> I love but that. um you know people really do seem to respond to constant 
uh, uh, reinforcement. And that has, we have seen, been both amazingly useful and kind of dangerous. I mean, we've seen that some people get way too into that and we've seen how it, it exacerbates social divisions. Um, you know, so, so uh, yes, uh, that being said, I don't think that the kind of virtual reality interface that everybody likes to imagine, uh, I've never understood that. <laughs> it's like, I, I want to be able to- Have you ever rocked a PSVR headset? Because those things are crazy fun. <laughs> I, you know, even the lightsaber for, game where you go like this is fun, right? For playing a game, but okay, we had a Wii for a while when my kids were younger, and, and you, said, you know, I had a Model T. Cars are all right, <laughs> yeah, but you know, we had a Wii, and sure, you know, the Wii. The whole thing was that you had to get up and move around to play these sports games. Well, you know, basically everybody rapidly figured out the hacks that would allow them to just sit on the damn couch and play the games instead of having to get up and jump around because we're a creative species. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, I would much rather be able to just like, you know, type in a, an address or whatever, rather than having to walk through virtual space to get to some place <laughs> in uh, order to I, call I, somebody. I can, I can hear that. Okay. So I suspect, you know, we will undoubtedly be far more wired up than we are now. Um, you know, just seeing how my kids, uh, you know, exist so much of their time, you know, basically there's always a Discord channel open, no matter what. Oh yeah, doing. oh yeah. I mean, I don't know nothing. I like, I am so low, I like information on Discord and I'm on two different Bengals Discords. Like I am trying my best to learn, but it's a new world um oh bangles i thought for a moment you said bangles and it's like well you like 80s pop groups that's good no i'm from, from southwest ohio man uh, okay. all that being said uh i i want to think about a couple things here for the audience so what's the best way to follow you what's the best way to stay up to speed on on new books and short stories and your thoughts on things like the james webb telescope and stuff like that like what where should they follow you um, my primary online presence is my personal blog, www.jamescambius.com, and that's where I announce everything that needs announcing. Um, I also am uh, moderately active on Facebook, being an old person, um, uh, but that's about it, really. Uh, don't look for me on Twitter. If you see somebody who's claiming to be me on Twitter, send me an email so I can, you know, have them assassinated or whatever, because I have a Twitter account that exists solely to keep other people from having Twitter accounts with my name. There we go. Just kind of hold it in place. Well, um, if, if if folks are interested, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of positive reviews for your books on Goodreads, and it's just really cool to see uh, I'm not alone and loving your really creative, cool sci-fi. So, um, and now fantasy. So I say to you, like, Thank you for spending the better part of an hour with me, and I'm very excited to follow your your the rest of your publishing career and, and jump into some of the books that you highlighted today. And uh, any kind of final words or last thoughts before we kind of close out? Well, thank you very much for inviting me to do this. I mean, it's been very gratifying to see somebody who's really enjoyed what I've written. You know, uh, um, writers like to hear from fans <laughs> you know we, we it's it's always it's always a nice uh, you know nice bit of positive reinforcement you know you know some books are 800 pages they're it's a 40 hour audiobook Corsair is like eight hours and just to kind of pitch it the narrator that you guys chose is it's just it's very good so that uh, that audiobook narrator um was an amazing, I, he sent me a, uh, we, we communicated and he wanted to make sure to get all of the correct pronunciations for everything. So I wrote him out a little pronunciation guide to every proper noun in the book, basically. Uh, and I thought that was, you know, a marvelous, you know, attention oh, yeah. to detail. He crushed it. He, he brought the book to life even more so. Um, it's funny, like I've got your Darkling C here. I managed to get this really, I love this cover by the way. The cover design is crazy good. Tom um, Tenery is the artist, very good artist. Very cool, yeah. And uh, Corsair, I finished it so quickly and we arranged the interview so quickly. I don't even have it in possession yet, but it's on the way. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, thank you for watching today. And, um, you know, 
I am just so grateful to have uh, a sci-fi bookstore online and the internet to be able to reach out to folks like you and talk sci-fi and and uh, and the Kardashev scale with someone outside of my fiance who will listen. But you know, when it's every day, it can get a little uh, exhausting. So this is a nice outlet to to nerd out with other people who um, are passionate about this type of stuff. So uh, just a quick closeout. I've got upcoming videos around the best books I read in 2021, the best films, the best sci-fi films. Uh, I've got a reading challenge with 12 books that you can read this year. And um, this year's, or um, this January, it's Micromegas from Voltaire. It's a one hour audiobook. It's a sci-fi story from the 1750s. And it is so good. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if in the very near future, we add some from uh, you, Jim. So thank you for joining us. And I uh, hope to see you on the next video. Thanks again. Uh, happy to be back. Thank you. Uh, thank you.